Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the news behind the news with Ralph Cantav on Mix 94.7 FM. And thank you for joining me on today's program. This afternoon, we're going to have quite an interesting conversation or chat as we delve into the world of healthcare and uh, beginning uh, a series, I would say, you know, speaking to different health professionals here in the island. And to start off with that, I have with me Dr. Friday. How are you doing, sir? Welcome to well, the program. thanks for having me. I know it's been a back and forth for a while, but I'm finally here. Great. Um, that's okay. I understand your schedule. Um, and, of course, your name is one that is uh, well-known. Yeah. But I'll have you uh, share a bit about yourself, you know, um, as an introduction. Well, Women's Health Services, um, located in Yogesh Complex, we've been open since 2008, Ralph. And I remember... When we were opening, there was so many pushback, and I think people misunderstood why. At that time, Dr. Scott was in charge of the hospital, and he wanted all specialists within the hospital. And I wanted to be outside of the hospital, so that was the back and forth at that point. So I decided to um, open my clinic after some back and forth. I don't know if you remember that. Because uh, they didn't um, want to give a license for someone to practice outside of the hospital. That was the issue. Uh -huh. And um, when I opened 2008, so we've been open now going on 14, 14 years, they said we wouldn't survive for six months. Maximum a year they gave us because of the challenges you would face by having your own facility and being outside the hospital. Hmm. So here we are 14 years later. Well, history tends to repeat itself. And I, I reference history because uh, just recently there was a court case as it related to some psychiatrists who wanted to operate, at least in this case, outside of mental health. Yeah. And, um, well, that was one. Um, but it uh, shows you how far back that was. Well, I think my issue was compounded because of the local issue. Yes, I was that just, just going to add that too. <laughs> but at this point, after 14 years, I would say I'm looking... I have a niece who's in medical school, but she's not interested. Well, I went to school, by the way. Yeah, she's you know not that. interested. She's in medical school locally, yeah. AUC. She's not interested in OBGYN. So mm. for those out there interested in medicine, I mean, I'm not doing this forever. I'm looking for someone, a young person now, to come and take over the clinic. For instance, in the next five, six, seven years. I think that's the challenge I have now is that if you build something, you want someone to continue it. Yes. But no one seems to be interested in OBGYN. It's a difficult specialty. Um, I guess it was, it, it's something worth looking into to see how many uh, St. Martin students maybe are abroad currently studying I've that. I've had discussions with if many of them. It's just that this specialty is not something they're interested in. I even spoke to my daughter to see if she's interested. They're just not. Not many people want to get up at 3 in the morning to do a delivery. And, and don't forget, we're dealing with two patients, the mother and the and baby. The so it's a difficult process. You can have one, one affects the other. You can have one that's okay and the other one that's not. So you have some difficult decisions to make. Hmm. Well, it's good to at least see that um, you defied uh, the statements made. Yeah. Well, I know I would because <laughs> I, when I started, remember Dr. Petty was a staunch advocate. And I, I, I learned so much from him uh, when I first came back. I think sometimes we have a problem with um, learning from others. I have no problem with that. When I first came back, I went and followed Petty. He taught me so much business-wise and medical-wise. Because the way you practice medicine on St. Martin is never the way you will practice in Antigua, uh, St. Kitts, not even the U.S. Mm -hmm. There's a particular way to practice medicine here. Based on the resources available, you have to know what to do and what not to do. And I think that's what Petty taught me. So I'm grateful for the two to three years that I had with him because that really um, got me going in uh, a particular direction. Okay. So as far as entering this specific uh, profession, where did the motivation and inspiration come from? When I went to medical school, I first wanted to be a urologist. Um, that's dealing with the prostate, the blood, or the kidneys. That was my main goal, but then, I've told this story a couple times, in my second year of medical school, I met this great gynecologist from Grenada. Mm. And he knew my family, you know the Fridays originally are from Grenada, he knew my family back home. So once again, like Petty, afterwards, he was my mentor there. And uh, I stuck to him and I just saw how he operated and how he did things and I just became interested. 
And um, that's why I switched now to OBGYN. But I have no regrets. Yeah. And uh, what school did you go to and how, and how long did it take to So I went to Howard undergrad for four years. And then I went to Patriot. Howard Medical School for nice. four years. It was a great experience. Um, we had many Samaritans there. Miguel went there. Yeah. Deva, Pedro. Um, uh, many different other people went there. But at that particular time, those were there at that time. And then I went to Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit for five years. That was a great experience also because Detroit has a similar population to we that we have in terms of um, medical conditions. Hmm, I see. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, you mentioned something that I actually like to get into uh, before we, I guess, we get into the health-related matters, which is the business side of it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, as you said, uh, setting up a practice or your practice on this island is different from elsewhere. Um I guess what would you say are the main markers of that, but also as far as um, establishing yourself, what was the process like getting resources for equipment and, and, uh, and software? Well, f- for me, it was like. a challenge because um, when you're young and you're, you're, you're from a particular place, you're expected to do certain things and you want to prove yourself somewhat in the first years. And oftentimes... You want to, you're so focused on the medical part that you forget the business part, but they both mesh together eventually, and you got to face both of them. But if you take care of the medical part, the business part will eventually take care of itself. But um, there were some challenges in the beginning um, on how you mesh the two together. They say that doctors make the worst patients and the worst businessmen. <laughs> so I had some challenges in the beginning, but... I think we're where we want to be after 14 years. I don't think anyone saw that we would have been at this point after 14 years with over close to 3,000 deliveries, uh, C-section and otherwise, and over 2,500, 3,000 surgical procedures. So if we have a population where the deliveries are 300 to 350 per year, and you've done close to 3,000 of those, then you've you've made a significant mark. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. And with that, um, with all the years you've been practicing, uh, what, do you, what would you say is the most common concern that you've noted among women um, who've come into your facility? Um, there are a couple. One of the first issues is fibroids. Fibroids are a huge issue in this area, in the entire Caribbean and in um, the United States. But we have fibroids of benign growths from the uterus, from the womb. If you line up 10 St. Martin women, I believe at least four or five of them have fibroids of some sorts. That's the books say stagnant. that's too much, but that's what we're facing. We're seeing younger and younger women have larger and larger fibroids, and how do you deal with that? Because we're dealing with women now who are in the reproductive age. You're 28 years old and you, need, you want to have a child eventually, but you have these large fibroids. So. It's difficult to manage in the U.S. You have many different resources how you can deal with that. But here our resources are limited in how we deal with it in terms of minimally invasive procedures. But if you're well, seeing... Sorry, what do you mean by that? Minimally there are invasive. many different procedures and okay. medications available in the U.S. But for us, the greatest challenge is if we're seeing younger and younger women <laughs> with larger and larger fibroids, how do we maintain their fertility for later years, and that's the biggest challenge that we face. The other challenge is infertility. It still is taboo, really, to say that you can't get pregnant. I think many women who come to my clinic, they make an appointment under a different condition, and then when they come to me, that's the discussion. Uh, And also, if we decide to proceed with a fertility treatment, some are reluctant to tell their family members and and so forth so it's still a taboo where fertility is concerned but i think more women are talking about it yes now. and we had a lecture a couple of weeks ago about that and i think once we have these conversations like this one more often then women will know that many others are facing this issue also yes so it's not something to be sort of ashamed afraid of. Or, yeah or ashamed of as yeah. well yes because uh, indeed it's it is that cultural um, element of you know um People ask me, what's wrong with you? you know, exactly, you know, because you know, pregnancy is yeah. exclusively <laughs> it's a like woman you have issue. To, yeah. you know? So it's exclusively uh, a woman issue. So many right. times they make the appointment under a different um, complaint. And also, majority of the time, the man doesn't come because 
where they're thinking, oh, you can't get pregnant, but over 25 to 30 percent of the time, it's a male factor that contributes to infertility also. Yeah. So um, getting the man in is a difficult challenge, but eventually I think most of them do participate, especially if they're doing IVF. I've, what's that? Sorry. In vitro fertilization, okay. we have a, a partnership. The majority of what we do right now is fertility related. We have a partnership with Palm Beach Fertility Center in Palm Beach, Florida. And we send uh, all the patients we deal with with fertility, we co-manage with them. Including men? Uh, yes, okay. of course. Because as I said, it's a couple issues, mm -hmm. not necessarily just, only a woman correct. issue. So we send a lot of patients to do in vitro fertilization to that facility, and then we manage them here initially, and then we send them there when it's time to do so. Right now we have two or three women up there getting IVF uh, yeah, treatment what at is the that, facility. What, what is a treatment procedure So like? in vitro fertilization is done for many different reasons, but basically the concept is you take medication to get the eggs going, we can do that locally, give the medication locally, do the ultrasound locally, and we have a schedule. So the schedule will tell the patient when to travel, and when they travel to our um, partners in Florida, and they retrieve the eggs in Florida, retrieve the eggs, and the partner gives the sperm, and they create the embryo outside of the body. So they create the embryo and then implant it within the uterus. So that's basically what in vitro fertilization mm -hmm. What's is. What's the success rate of that? Uh it depends on each facility, but the, the facility we work with in Florida is extremely successful. Okay. And um, it also depends on the reason you need IVF because don't forget there are ma five main factors that you would need IVF unknown. And this is the greatest challenge, 25% of the reason why, reasons we don't know why a woman can't get pregnant. So one out of four women who are dealing with fertility issues, we don't know why. Then there's the male factor, which many men don't want to admit. There's the uterine factor, like fibroids and so forth, and ovulation factor and, and so forth. So there's many different factors why people will get IVF. But the success rate with this facility has been great, actually. Okay. Now, uh, particularly as it relates to the issue of uh, fibroids, is that one, can it be prevented, and is it something that's um, hereditary? Uh, what are the main causes well, of first that? First of all, yes, there is a genetic predispos predisposition mm -hmm. to fibroids in that if your mother has it, there's a great chance you would have it also. And I, as I said, we're seeing younger and younger women with fibroids at 24, 25, 26 years old. And it's been a great challenge. Um, and many women don't know they have fibroids until they get pregnant and they come for their first ultrasound. Because if you're 24, 25, and you're not, you didn't have any um, concern with pregnancy, there's no reason to get an ultrasound. So the first ultrasound you will get is to see that you are pregnant, and that's where we see they have fibroids. And then that is the dilemma. How do we deal with a pregnant woman who has fibroids while she's pregnant? Yeah, how because it? you can't do anything at that point. Yeah. So I encourage all women, the time you're supposed to get pap smears is 21 and above, regardless of sexual intercourse. So I encourage all women at tw between 25 and 21 and 25 to get a pap smear. And while you're getting a pap smear, get a baseline ultrasound also to see if you have fibroids. Um, that's not recommended by any society, but I think you have to tailor your medical care towards the society you're living in. And if we're seeing so many young women with fibroids, then I think you need a baseline ultrasound between 21 and 25. Okay. And in terms of, from a policy perspective, I guess these are elements that would go into directing um, health care on the island as far as uh, I, I don't know if you can create a policy around fibroids. I well, mean, not fibroids per se, but I mean in terms of uh, certain care well, the, procedures. The, 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 we have to be careful in terms of um, mm -hmm. telling doctors what to do and when to do it. There are enough advisory committees around. Okay. For instance, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists will tell us when we need to do pap smears, when we need to do ultrasounds. I am saying... In addition to doing that pap smear, you now have an opportunity to do something else that's gotcha. affecting your society. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to tailor that to individual needs because just like the vaccine with pregnancy, um, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists says this one thing, 
But then how do the women of St. Martin feel about getting the vaccine during pregnancy? That's an issue you have to individualize also. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, okay, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, actually, I'll, I, I guess I'll just <laughs> get in, go into the vac well, vaccine, meaning COVID yeah. in particular. Um, for one, uh, during the the height or pandemic period of COVID-19. Well, can you share some info with us as it relates to um, uh, what you've uh, realized in terms of getting getting COVID while pregnant and um, yeah. the outcomes on the debate about If you remember, um, Ralph, in December 2020, I believe it was the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration of the U.S., issued the emergency use authorization for the Pfizer vaccine first, the mRNA vaccine, and within their advisory, they said that the vaccine to pregnant women should be individualized between the patient and the physician. But then the advisory committee, which a lot of us follow, ACOG, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, said that we should offer the vaccine to all women. Um, for me, what I do is I individualize the process and have a discussion with the women in terms of... Um, we don't know all the pros and cons yet, but the ACOG has said it's safe during pregnancy. But I still individualize the issue with each each pregnant woman. Okay. Yeah. Um, and even with that, is there a regional or, or local advisory body as well? Or, or would Not that I'm aware of. I think, uh, well, uh, we have the ones that was giving the vaccine. Um, CPS? The, yeah, CPS was giving yeah. the vaccine. and. Um, but I mean, like, in terms of... Let's say an uh, association collective of doctors who perhaps, you know. Well, I think many sense. of the doctors deal with the advisory committees where they practice or where they studied, um, the international committees. I think what we can do is, um, even as a, a group of doctors or individual doctors, is just go based on what the international community does. But we have to individualize it based on the patients we're serving at that point. For sure. And I have. Um, I've dealt with many of those questions. This was the biggest topic this year and last year. Um, should I get the vaccine or not while pregnant? And believe it or not, I mean, many of the questions they're asking, we don't know the answers to as yet because the time, how does a child at five years old, that child who got the vaccine while in utero, mm -hmm. what happens to them when they're five years old? We don't know because it's not been Data five years. Data, so. Yeah. Many of the questions that patients have, um, we can't truthfully answer. But what we do know is the short-term studies that they've given vaccine to pregnant women and analyzed babies one or two one year after, and those babies have been fine. No increased rate of miscarriage, no increased rate of congenital anomalies. That we do know. But are there going to be behavioral issues at five years? We don't know. But the most important thing, Ralph, is we have to now deal with risk. If you're pregnant and you get COVID, the majority of time you're going to be asymptomatic because you have to look at the age group of pregnancy, 15 to 44 is where we consider the fertile age. That age group predominantly is healthy. So if you get COVID, you should be asymptomatic in that age group. However, they have those patients who have other comorbidities like hypertension and diabetes. Mm -hmm. So those patients, pregnant or not, are high risk for COVID. So if you add pregnancy onto that, which has a lot of physiological changes because of pregnancy, so the majority of time if you get COVID during pregnant, you're going to be okay because of that age group. But if you're going to get ill, you're going to get very ill because of the specific changes of pregnancy. So that's the message. So you have to have that discussion with, we do not have all the answers with the vaccine and pregnancy. But this is what potentially can happen if yeah. you get COVID. So mm -hmm. you have to weigh the, weigh the risk, pros and cons with each patient. Yes, Because I understand. Um, there are certain risk factors um, in terms of getting COVID and pregnancies, in terms of being very symptomatic. And has there been any data or studies released on um, babies who were born uh, with mothers who had COVID? Yes, well, I mean, I've delivered many COVID patients. And nothing, um, I mean, The babies have done fine. And okay. There's little vertical transmission of COVID. So if a mother is, a patient is pregnant and, and she has COVID, so mm -hmm. there's not much transmission, uh, little to zero transmission of COVID from the mother to the to fetus in utero. 
Then the issue is what happens after because we promote worldwide and St. Martin, the hospital really does a great job in promoting breastfeeding and bonding in those first couple of days. So if a mother's COVID positive, she just delivered, we still want her to bond with her baby. And um, we promote that. We just have to take precautions, wearing gloves, washing hands often, but breastfeeding and bonding with the baby is very important in the first couple of days, regardless of COVID. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and I'm, one of the things I'm curious about as well is, uh, as, like, you kind of touched on it when it related to the topic of fertility when we um, mentioned that, but in general, as, as it comes to, you know, just maternal care um, during pregnancy, uh, how do you rate, I don't, I don't think maybe you, you write this down, but how do you, in, in your opinion, rate the support of fathers in, you know, in, in that as well? I think it's better than you would think. Okay. It's better than you would think. Of course, um, we live in a society where, um, you know, we learn many things from our parents and our grandparents. But the, the support of men is great during pregnancy. That's um, great. I think uh, many people would be surprised. If I see 20 pregnant women in a day, I would say at least 10 or 11 come with a partner. So it's 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 better than you think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, I know one of the scares uh, as well with pregnancy is miscarriages. Mm -hmm. um, can you sh detail, I guess, one, what are the main factors that, that lead to, to miscarriages and, and how can it be prevented? It's a, it's a challenge. Um, if a patient comes in pregnant with high blood pressure, we give medication. Patient comes in pregnant with diabetes, we can give medication. There's no medication to detect or prevent a miscarriage because most of the miscarriages are preordained from the time of conception. The number one cause of miscarriage is a genetic abnormality. And many women miscarry and don't even know because miscarriages happen from five to seven weeks, mostly five to seven, five to eight weeks. And a woman can ideally miss two periods and just think, oh, my, my period is late. And then eventually she bleeds and she thinks it's her period, but it's actually a miscarriage. So many miscarriages are not accounted for because many women report it as a late period. But uh, say, for instance, a patient misses a period and she gets an ultrasound within the next two weeks. Um, then we can see if everything is okay. But Many people miscarry and, and they don't know about it. They think it's a, a late period. But I would say at least uh, 15 to 18 percent of pregnancies miscarry. I would say even up to 20 percent. And that's would that also be too high? No, because a lot of women now are putting off pregnancy for later, 35, 36. And don't forget, the later you put off pregnancy for, the more abnormal the eggs are or the less better quality. Let's listen. A woman never produces new eggs during her lifetime. A man can get a woman pregnant at 75 because he's producing new sperm. A woman is born with 2 million eggs. By the time she has a teenage year, she has 400,000. Every month during ovulation, there's 1,000 eggs that's going up Shut to up. ovulate, but only one ovulates. But 1,000 eggs are gone. So the fertile rate, the fertile age is between 15 and 44, but the best time for fertility is between 15 and 30, obviously. After 30, what we call the ovarian reserve or the quality and the number of eggs drop drastically. So many women are putting off pregnancy for later. And if the quality of eggs are not the best after 30, particularly after 35, then you're going to have an increased rate of miscarriages. So the miscarriages are less in women under 25 and much more over women over 35. Hmm. And um, you're seeing many more women at this point putting off pregnancy for various reasons. Career, yeah, most, yeah, more, economics, mostly economics, yeah. building their house, you know, finding the right partner. So there are many reasons. But factors, I'm saying yeah. <laughs> from the time I started 14 years ago, mm -hmm. more and more women over 35 are getting pregnant. Okay. okay. Yeah. That says a lot too. Yeah. Um, well, on one note, I guess after this, I don't know if you've ever considered it, but probably teaching would be a, a good <laughs> well, career switch. Well, uh, for myself, I like dealing with patients because, mm -hmm. don't forget, I'm from here. So a lot of the patients I know, or they know me, or they know my family. So it's uh, 
It's not just a medical discussion I have. It's sometimes a social discussion. That's yeah. why sometimes <laughs> I guess the clinic, there's a waiting time because I, I know a lot of the people who come to me. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Um, and so even in, uh, with the issue of miscarriages, I guess, uh, fertility treatments help with that? Or, or would well, do they, actually, do they fertility lessen the treatments increase possibly? the rate of miscarriages. Oh, They okay. do significantly, particularly IVF. And um, the greatest challenge to IVF is the cost. Although the cost of IVF has not increased over the last 10 years, we're still talking $10,000, dollars 12000 which is a challenge for most people. Yeah, I can And uh, we've had women who've had two, three, four IVF cycles, so it can get up there. We also have a relationship with a clinic in Colombia, which is much cheaper. So I offer patients both of them. Um, but um, the majority go to Florida. Okay. And then um, on your end, uh, with forming these relationships, I'm assuming most likely you, you've traveled and um, that's how you go about well, working yeah, with them I, I, or, the, or the, have they reached out to you? The right? fertility but center that we partnered with, mm -hmm. actually, I think 2016, 17, we had a large lecture at the Bel Air Community Center. And there was a large turnout um, of women. And he... Um, even did some clinic here also, and um, it's a great facility. I think they do great things, and um, I've visited many times, and um, I most majority of the patients are successful. There's never a hundred percent successful, but at least they feel comfortable that myself that and that facility gave everything we could to get that patient pregnant. Yeah. Now, uh, as it relates to births as well, one of the things um, I've seen that has been trending. Uh, at least online, I don't think here, but well, I don't know either, <laughs> but it's the phenomenon of the natural birth, so to speak, I think, where you do the births in the, the pool. And so whatnot. that's the IVF we were talking about. Oh, that's really? The, that's the, that's the, the language but, uh, that I think we're trying to change. The dual, the dual, what? The, the doula? Oh, 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 that's what you're talking without medication. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, like yeah, 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 15 years ago was 4 million births per year. So the birth rate has decreased drastically worldwide, mm. even before the pandemic. But the pandemic, because of the anxiety yes. and the economic issues, has even gotten worse. Yeah. But after a pandemic, you usually see an increase in births. But we haven't seen that because this pandemic, this crisis is unlike any other because it's lasting two going into three years now. Yeah. So... And then the spin-off in terms of the econ like uh, the economic recession. issues, the access to health care. Yes. So, I mean, uh, we've Cost not seen living. any increase in the births, and I don't think we'll see for a long time. But this is a worldwide issue. China has seen it. The U.S. has seen it. And St. Martin has seen it significantly. Um, for a small society, you might say there's not a big difference between 300 and 400 deliveries. But that's a lot for a small society. Yeah. Because if you extrapolate it to a big place like the U.S., we're talking maybe 500, 400,000 births, you know? Mm, I see. So okay. it's, a, it's a huge issue. But I think in time it would correct itself because we need a certain amount of births to continue the population, right? That's right. So in time, I believe it would correct itself. Okay. So we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the news behind the news with Rav Kentav on Mix 94.7 FM. And thank you for sticking with me on today's program as I'm joined here in the studio with the famous Dr. Friday. And I was just joking with him saying that I feel like this interview is like an intensive course. <laughs> uh, but I really appreciate the information that you're sharing. Um, and uh, so with that, one of the um, common or let's say movements that I've noted uh, that you see around the world is as it relates to the push for reproductive health, which particularly entails, for example, med medical coverage for contraception. From your professional standpoint, what are the benefits or the need for provision of free or sub subsidized subsidized every, contraceptives? Um, every um, large society, we can refer back to the U.S., if you're going to have a large insurer like Obamacare, for instance, they cover 14 different types of contraceptions without copay. 
Um, having contraceptives available to women is not only a pregnancy prevention issue, it's also a economic issue, a social issue, but also we have the idea that uh, contraception just prevents pregnancy, but what it does, it has other secondary um, issues. Also, it prevents ovarian cysts, it prevents painful periods, it um, controls the cycle. So it has so many different issues besides pregnancy prevention. And what we have currently is we have the largest insurer, which is SZV, who do not cover contraception for ZV patients, but they do for BZV. But based on my experience, the ratio of BZV to ZV, what I can see from my my clinic is is that uh, for every one BZV patient, there's three as ZV patients, so probably 70 to 30. So we're missing 70% of the population that we potentially can cover with contraception. I know there's a economic issue in covering patients on that large scale, but we must find a way to offer comprehensive contraception to um, patients in St. Martin. I think the benefits will be great in terms of the complications that we can prevent. And the number one thing is unintended pregnancy. I would... I would submit actually that 75 to 80 percent of pregnancies are unintended on the island, wow. not unwanted. I say unintended, unplanned. Yes. Unplanned is a better word. Mm -hmm. um, because of the access to contraception, there's also a, a miseducation about contraception. When I say contraception to the majority of the patients, the first thing they think about is a pill. But there are so many different forms. There's the pill, there's the rod in the arm, there's the patch, there's the IUD. There's many different forms of contraception. So the conversations that we're having now are important, but also the access is important. If you're going to tell a patient she has to pay for contraception, then it's a difficult process spending $10, $15, $20 a month on contraception. It's difficult for a lot of people. And also going to the pharmacy every month. And even if the pharmacy can give you three medications, three months in a row, you still need to come up with $30, $40 for those three months. So a lot of the patients start off on birth control but end up stopping at some point because they don't have time to go back to the pharmacy. They don't have the funds. So um, the whole issue of contraception needs to be addressed. And uh, you know, it's going to affect those women who need it the most, the women who are uh, struggling financially and um, actually at this point don't want any pregnancy until they can reach a fin another financial position. Mm -hmm. But if they can't afford or they don't have access to contraception, then they end up pregnant. You're putting a burden not only on them but on the system also. So it affects those who I would see are, are less fortunate or least, less economically available to get the contraception. It affects those the most. And I think that's why it needs to be looked into to be made available under the larger insurance program, which is ZV. I, I'm, f I, I'm fully aware of the economic consequences of that, but mm -hmm. I think the impact it would have on the society is so great that it should be looked into seriously. Particularly, as I said, Ralph, with the group of people it's affecting. Um, so I think this will be a major shift. And, um, you know, there are certain things that you can do in society that changes the perception yep. and changes the outlook. And For instance, if we have um, comprehensive access to contraception for every person that's covered under the, the insurance, then we would see the number of unplanned pregnancies drop significantly. And if we see the number of unplanned pregnancies drop significantly, then that patient now doesn't have to make a decision on that unplanned pregnancy. Um, that patient, no. If you have an unplanned pregnancy, that means you're sometimes not economically available to do the things necessary for that pregnancy in that child. Mm -hmm. And also sometimes you don't continue the pregnancy in one way or the other. And I think that is the challenge. So if we have um, comprehensive contraceptive care available, one, we would see the number of unplanned pregnancies drop significantly and the number of abortions drop significantly because... If you have 80, a society with 80% unplanned pregnancies, the abortion rate is going to 
um, be reflective of that. And I think that's one issue that we have to address. And I will touch lightly on the abortion issue. I approached Parliament in 2010 about this issue. Okay, quite a while back. It's an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, and it can be addressed. And when I say address, I mean, it's either we're in or we're out. And if we're in, what are the parameters? Not only for um, us as physicians, but also for patient care. They need to know what's available to them. And, of course, we have the issue of um, a lot of medication being sold for um, those abortions, being sold on the street un unlawfully, and patients know where to get them. So a lot of the times I see patients who come to me after getting that medication on the road. It's difficult to control that, but we can with significant fines. Um, because that's the challenge that if a patient doesn't have prenatal care, doesn't know how far along she is, takes a pregnancy test and realizes she's pregnant and then goes to the sh somewhere and buys medication and takes it and forces an abortion, she could be 12 weeks, she can be 13, 14. There are complications to that, significant complications, bleeding being one of them. Yeah, yeah I was going to ask if you, um, you could actually detail what happens, what are the main bleeding. causes, bleeding is the, uh, what causes but impacts. Bleeding is the main one. And mm -hmm. You can actually bleed significantly with a 12-week pregnancy if you try to abort. Not, yes, bleed tremendously. And if you have no prenatal care, you don't know what your blood level is. You don't know anything. All you know is you're trying to... Get rid a pregnancy, of a, yeah, and once yeah. again, Ralph, it's affecting the people who financially uh, uh, need it the most yeah. in terms of the contraceptive care, because some at that point, people at that point are desperate. It's a difficult pro It's a difficult problem, because if you have two kids and you're just making ends meet, um, and you don't have adequate access to contraceptive care, you now have to make a decision of spending that ten, fifteen dollars a month, which is difficult. Um, getting the prescription for it, that means visiting a doctor. And um, if you don't proceed with the contraception, ending up with an unplanned pregnancy, and then what decision do you make at that point? So I, I think for a society that's moving forward, that's trying to do different things, this is one of the things we have to address, the contraception issue. If we address that, we will see many of the other issues take care of themselves. Okay. Um, no, I'm not looking to put you too much on the spot with this question in particular, but um, it's something that, is, that always comes up in a debate mm -hmm. about um, sex and so forth, which is should teenagers be provided with contraceptives? Yes, for sure. No, um, the issue with well, women under 25, the greatest concern I have is the rate of chlamydia is extremely high. Sorry, and um, what's chlamydia? A sexually transmitted disease oh. such as gonorrhea. Okay. The rate of chlamydia is extremely high in women 25 and below. That is the greatest challenge. But I think the, the, the issue is we don't talk about these issues enough. For When I tell many of the young girls that they have chlamydia, the first thing is, what is that? And um, if we have these discussions in the last couple of years of high school, then I think young girls will be more aware of it because there are consequences with getting chlamydia infertility, pain, and so forth. So I, I think it's an education process and having these conversations will make that easier moving forward. Yes, yeah. because um, already culturally, again, it is pretty taboo for parents themselves to, yeah. to so sometimes I mean, a speak lot of to the, their children about But they have a lot it. of teenagers on contraception. And once again, when I say contraception, is not only the pill. The, yeah. <laughs> uh, on contraception, not for contra the benefits of contraception. They are on the benefits of... Some young girls have irregular periods, so we put them on the pill for cycle control. Some young girls have painful periods, so we put them on the pill for decreased pain with the period. So it's uh, added uh, the additional benefits to contraception besides uh, preventing pregnancy. Oh, preventing prevention of pregnancy. Okay. and But in, even with that... Um the side effects, what are, are they harsh? Well, one of the things, the greatest challenge we have is the first thing I talk to many patients, young and old, about contraception, the first thing they say is, I don't want the pill because it makes me gain weight. Yeah, I've heard That's that. That's the first response. 
So I take a deep breath first of all, and I, I, I go through the challenge that the combined hormones, the estrogen and progesterone contraception, which most of the pills are, there's been no evidence that those uh, lead to weight gain at all. Now, there are other contraceptions that have only progesterone that can lead to some temporary weight gain and bloating, but I'm talking about the common contraceptions which contain estrogen and progesterone. They ideally don't lead to weight gain because they are not the contraception from 15, 20 years ago. They're very low dose hormones, so the side effects are minimal. Uh, we're talking probably 15 micrograms of um, estrogen, where in the past, in our grandmother days, it was 30 micrograms of estrogen. So the, the side effects are minimal, and weight gain is not an issue with birth control. I can't say that often enough. Okay. You know, it's okay. a huge um, um, block for women getting being on birth control, thinking that they may gain weight. And does it affect future pregnancies? No, it does not, actually. Okay. Um, particularly, the pill does not, because if you look at what the pill does, it stops ovulation, and you have to take it every day. So it doesn't stay in your system for a long time. So if you stop a pill, you were on the pill in October, and it prevented mm -hmm. ovulation in October, but you stopped in November, you're going to ovulate in November, and then at that point you can get pregnant. So there's no lasting issues of preventing pregnancy um, with the pill in particular. Okay, and then uh, as far as efficacy, um, if you happen to skip a few few days. Well, that's the challenge also is that well, I try to tell women to make it a routine. Okay. It's not like you have to take the pill every day at 8 a.m., but if you tie the taking the pill to uh, something you do every morning, taking a shower, brushing your teeth, then it becomes a routine and then you don't forget it. The pill is only as effective as how often you use it. And that's the issue. If you miss a day, you should take two the next day. If you miss two, you're in a difficult position. You may just ovulate that cycle. Yeah. So that's the challenge we have, not only getting the pill, but taking it in a timely fashion. But as I said, there are other contraceptive methods. There's an injection for three months. There's a patch weekly. A lot of young women use that. And then there's the IUD, which um, a lot of women over 35 choose also, the intrauterine device, which can last for up to five years. Okay. So a lot of older women choose the IUD as 35 and above, and a lot of women 13 below choose the pills and the injections and so forth. Well, what happens in cases if it shifts or moves? The or IUD we're talking mm -hmm. about? Yes, correct. Well, for, uh, there is an issue of the IUD um, doing some strange things once it's in, but... For myself, I have an ultrasound, so I document the position of the IUD before I let the patient go. But if uh, it's all physician dependent, if a physician is not used to putting in the IUD and they do it blindly without an ultrasound, mind you, the recommendation is to not use an ultrasound, by the way, because we want everyone to be available to put in the IUD so you get a larger segment of the population who would be available to get the IUD. But for uh, myself, I document that it's in the right position with the ultrasound, and that um, prevents a lot of the long-term issues. But overwhelmingly, the majority of women are satisfied with the IUD, and the response I get is, why didn't I do this before? And the Internet is a wonderful thing because the first thing a woman does is Google the IUD, and then you see all these bad stories. But um, overwhelmingly, the large 90% of women are satisfied with the IUD, those who are older and finished with childbearing, they want something long-term. They don't want to be taking something every yeah, day sad. with hormones. IUD, you put in, you don't have to take anything every day. There's no hormones, so your period is regular also. And, and you're protected for five years. And uh, protection rate, is that what, what is it's, it? It's very effective. Okay. In the last 14 years, I've seen two women get pregnant with the IUD, and we've put in um, over 1,000 of them. So we're talking less than 0.2% at this point. Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, another taboo topic is uh, SDDs. Mm -hmm. um, very touchy, I, I can imagine. Um, but uh, as far as the years of which you've um, been um, treating patients and so forth, what would you say are the main uh, STDs that uh, tend to rear? Well, as I said, chlamydia is the major challenge we have. The issue with chlamydia is it's asymptomatic. I document a lot of my chlamydia positive patients because that's a test we do for pregnancy evaluation in the first trimester. 
But a lot of patients with chlamydia are asymptomatic, meaning they have no symptoms, no vaginal discharge, no pain. Um, if they come to me, it's mostly postcoital bleeding, meaning bleeding after intercourse. That's one of the major symptoms you have of chlamydia. But um, a lot of them are asymptomatic, so I catch a large group of patients when they come for that first couple of visits for prenatal care. And we're seeing more and more of chlamydia as the years go by, particularly with the young women 25 and below. Okay. And um, gonorrhea, not so much. I probably see two or three cases of gonorrhea a year versus maybe um, 40 to 50 of chlamydia per year. And where does it stand on your... Or HIV. It's not as much, um, really. Um, I think people would think it's a lot, but it's not actually. And I think our behaviors have changed over the years. But um, in terms of, uh, once again, pregnancy allows you to check for various other things um, besides just being pregnant. So we do general labs at that point. So that's when we document a lot of the issues. Many women don't know they have hypertension until that first visit for prenatal care. Many of them don't know they have diabetes until pregnancy. And many of them don't know they're HIV positive until pregnancy. But in, and do in they 14 largely years, I've probably seen four or five cases. It's not as predominant, um, luckily. Um, especially in that age group, 15 to 44, that's where it would be predominant. Because it's, yes, yeah. more, more sexually active. Yeah, but it's not actually. I think chlamydia is a much bigger issue, but chlamydia has long-term consequences also. Which are? Like Infertility. Oh, if yeah, you, you get chlamydia really, yeah. over and over again, it can actually block your tubes and cause scarring. Oh, so it's uh, something you can get rid of? Yes, we give medication and it's treated right away. However, it is sexually transmitted. That means if you have intercourse with the same partner who was not treated, you can get it again. And mm -hmm. that is the challenge. I see what you're saying. Because when you tell a patient she has chlamydia, that begs a long conversation at home, which many men are not comfortable with. <laughs> so unless both people are treated, it's something that can and get reinfected. And it's dangerous during pregnancy because causing can cause eye problems, uh, blindness, and so forth. So uh. I caution a lot of young women to have their partner get tested before resuming intercourse again. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, one of the factors that uh, some women tend to deal with is post postpartum depression. Mm. Um, uh, for your clinic, do, is that a care that you guys provide also? And, and how, there, how, how do you advise um, people to deal with that? Ralph, there are so many things that we face that are not being addressed. I think it's a cultural thing. Imagine for a minute a woman just delivered and she's going through some emotional issues and um, going through some ups and downs and actually crying quite often, which is one of the symptoms of postpartum depression. What would you think from your experience would a man's uh, reaction to that be? What's wrong with you? Get over it. <laughs> you just delivered. It's going to be okay. Wouldn't, can't you see a Caribbean man saying that? Because the issue of postpartum depression, they're not aware of it. Most men and most women also. So I see a lot of postpartum depression, not because a woman is coming to me saying she has postpartum depression, but she comes after delivery, and I see the symptoms of postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. It's a huge issue, um, especially with the younger girls who don't know or don't have that strong support. family support. Yes, I can imagine. Um, the older women have that support, but the issue is that a lot of men don't know that exists. And um, I've seen a lot of cases of postpartum depression, and thankfully postpartum depression usually lasts maybe two to three to four weeks and goes away, but sometimes it can last much longer. But patients who had predisposing depression before pregnancy are more um, apt to get um, postpartum depression. Gotcha. Now, in the beginning, you stated that um, basically, you know, you're, you're looking for someone to take over. You're, you're like that, um, you know, of those who are uh, presently studying uh, in the medical field that, you know, um, they could get into the, the um, OBGYN. Mm -hmm. But um, as it relates to other professions in the health industry, um, have you noted other areas where, you know, we can use more um, students to, to... All of them. 
all of them. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have a situation at the hospital where we rotate. Thankfully, a lot of doctors from Holland made themselves available, so we rotate a lot of them from Holland and Suriname. But there are only, mm. um, I'm talking local doctors here, first of all. Um, when I say local, I mean born here. There's only a couple of us, myself, Holiday, Dr. Bird, and so forth. So I think every specialty is needed at this point. So I would encourage any young person who's, in listen, you have to be interested in medicine. You can't do this if you don't love it. First of all, you can't be paid for this. There's no amount of money that can compensate you for the stress you deal with on a regular basis. So you can't go into it for finances. You have to love it. You have to form a relationship with your patients. And if you are not into people, then you shouldn't be into medicine. So yeah, you have definitely. to do it because you want it. Yeah. want to do it, first of all. And um, I encourage them to, we have, um, I believe AUC has a relationship where they provide scholarships to locals also. Yes, they are. As I said, I my think niece over, is there over right a dozen now also, there, I think, right I now. Would, I mean, I, I like OBGYN. That doesn't mean the next person needs to, to like it, but I encourage um, our young people to ch go into medicine if they're interested in OBGYN in particular. Okay. Um, going back to, well, similar to your response on the question about postpartum depression. I'm curious as to what other areas um, that you've perhaps identified uh, as a need for investment or support where our healthcare is concerned. Um, the major issue is contraception because I think that would change so much things for us as physicians and improve the quality of life of our population, not just women, everyone. Because say for instance, a woman is 25 and she wants to put off her pregnancy uh, to finish school, college, put off pregnancy to get a better job, go to night school, do various things. Now you're talking about a woman who's more prepared than to raise a, a child yes. and be in a relationship. So you're talking about more wholesome, a basically. family at this point. Yes. So it creates a stronger society, a stronger population. And I think the greatest challenge we have right now is one, addressing the contraception issue and the access to contraception. And I think it will solve a lot of the other problems, as we said. It would curtail, curtail abortions because we have no less unintended um, pregnancies or unplanned pregnancies. Yes, I got you. Um, now, as far as a professional standpoint, uh, what would you say are the most uh, challenging parts of your career and how do you process it? Well, for me, it was uh, I took... I took the difficult road. I um, I took a road that no other OBGYN has taken besides Dr. Petty in being independent. And um, most of all the other specialists are employed. So you have an aspect of providing medical care but still running a business. And that's twofold. Many of the other specialists don't have to worry about that. So it's a greater challenge. And um, Petty warned me about the challenge, and it's been a great challenge to do both. Um, and um, I, I think because Petty was made, Petty made himself available for me. It was an easier transition, and that's why I said I'm looking for a young person interested in OBGYN because then I can pass on my knowledge also, so they can take over from there. So. I'm hoping they're they're interested because we're talking 12 years of preparation. So I know there are a lot of people now going into medical school, but that's still eight more years. Yes, correct. So we have to start now. Definitely. In eight years, we're talking 2030. Yes. And Who knows uh, where we'll all be at that point. Now, <laughs> correct, so. correct. Because um, even with that, I mean, yeah, you don't look at age, yeah. <laughs> but I know but that you kind of like to yeah. scale back a bit. Yeah, yeah but it's very rare, Ralph. Mm -hmm. You have to imagine this. So we're dealing with infertility. So we deal with a lot of patients who, preconception, so before pregnancy. And then we deal with them throughout the pregnancy. Then we have to deliver them. And then we deal with them postpartum. So this is the entire spectrum from beginning. Quite fast, Not yes. beginning of pregnancy, even before, preconception, because we deal with so much infertility. So as a, f as a facility that has one physician dealing with all of these issues, you see everything. You see everything possible from infertility to problems during pregnancy, problems during delivery. 
Um, for instance, um, there's a complication during pregnancy that the books say would happen one out of a thousand pregnancies. Well, last year I saw it five times out of 200 pregnancies. So our population is high risk, but you have to address the population as you see fit. That's why I said you can't practice medicine like you would in the U.S. because we have a different population. Yes, So, but I guess that also leads into different uh, conversations that we need to have as it relates to um, I guess the, the, health, the, the health position. You know, I of, think having of, conversations like this is important. Yeah, of, of the I think, nation. Um, of I, I purposely discuss the contraception issue because I want it to be heard. <laughs> and um, it's a great challenge. I mean, many women cannot afford contraception. Many women don't have the time to go to the pharmacy two to three times, maybe four times a year. And um, also there's the miseducation about contraception. So with our discussion about um, providing um, access to contraception, there's also a discussion about having a marketing campaign. And this is where it begins with conversations like this. Definitely. And uh, another factor that I think is uh, so important is, you know, um, one of the maybe fears or complaints that you sometimes hear students um, state is, man, uh, I will become a doctor if it takes so long to, you know, to, to study. Yeah. But I think, you know, as at the end of the day, um, given the timeline it takes, it now is really the time to ensure that we really um, showcase to our youth, you know, the, the endless possibilities just in the health sector alone, because at the end of the day, we, our nation and themselves, they are the ones who will be in need of, of well, that I mean, care. If you're looking to become a doctor and your first thing is it takes too long, then this is not for you. Yeah. You know, because it's not an exception in terms of you could do it in six rather than 12 years. Everyone takes the same time. So if you're looking at it and it takes too much time, then maybe this is just not for you, which is fine too. Yeah. As I said, if you are not loving medicine or loving the particular specialty that you're going into, then you shouldn't do this because there's no amount of compensation that can make up for the stress of doing these type of jobs. And then I think um, what, what may assist is to, uh, opposed to making it kind of broad, like, hey, you can become a doctor, is to show, you know, expose young people to, to different specialties, you know, and that they, that can uh, every, every help in, summer, uh, create, create every a summer, spark. I've never made it public, but I think people who know, know. Mm -hmm. I have uh, young people passing through my clinic for summertime. This summer we're going to have three young people, 17 and 18, pass through the clinic. Nice. And that's how we get people interested. So I've been doing this for 10 years where young people pass through the clinic. Unfortunately, none of them went into OBGYN, but <laughs> at least they get a taste of medicine. And I think most of them are going into medicine, though. Okay. And this summer is no different. Um, three of them are coming through also. All right. So, Dr. Fred, I'd like to thank you so much for coming on the program. Uh, there's definitely we can talk some. All day about yeah, it. no, but uh, <laughs> I'll have you back again. Uh, we'll be back. We'll be <laughs> for back. Sure, we'll for talk sure. some more. And I know, Ralph, based on the conversation we had today, there will be some further discussions because I purposely talked about a couple of issues. So, we'll have to follow up and have those discussions. And um, whatever policies comes about based on these discussions, I'm willing to be part of it. If it's a serious discussion um, yeah, sure. about contraception, about abortion, about fibroids, then we can have serious discussions that lead to policy change, not just talking for talking's sake. That's right. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning into today's program and be sure to join us again tomorrow. Take care.